You have faith because you fight. You fight the enemy. You fight demon spirits and strongholds and powers and principalities and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. You have faith because you submit yourself, therefore, to God. You resist the devil and he flees from it. You have faith because you trust in Jesus. And you've got to fight for that faith. All right, everybody go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Let's read together. 2 Timothy. Obviously, you can read on the screen with us as well. And the scripture says, To Timothy, my beloved son. Y'all ready? Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord, come on, but everybody read. I thank God whom I serve with it. Stop right now. Point at somebody who ain't reading. You ready? Let's go. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did. Longing to see you even as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy. which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm sure that it is in you as well. Sincere faith. Sincere faith. The thing is, if you can have sincere faith, there's a chance some people might have some insincere faith. And I just want to thank God today for those who have made their calling and election sure. The scripture says that Timothy didn't have this faith on accident he had this faith because of the women of God who raised him up so all over the room let's pray and ask God to speak to our hearts God obviously I need the utterance to speak as Paul the Apostle said pray for him to have utterance to speak God I want to speak about Jesus with boldness but God I want to be clear today God, I want to speak the truth in love. I don't want to be just some mean preacher, God. I want to speak the truth in love so that people will hear, Almighty God. God, let the gospel be clear as a result of me standing here to share this message, God. I pray that people will not be confused when they leave about who Jesus is. And God, help us today to celebrate mothers and all that you're doing in our lives. And we pray this, God, in the name above every name, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So thank God for you. I, I look at this, this text, and I want us to land on verse 5 for this purpose. I want us to land on verse 5, everyone, because, because Paul is saying, Timothy, you have sincere faith. And this sincere faith that you have, you didn't get it on accident. He doesn't just speak about his, his, Timothy's mother. He speaks about Timothy's grandmother. So in other words, his mother had faith, but his mother had faith because her mother had faith. Do you see the generational blessing? I pray for generational blessing in this room. I pray that you would be a good man who leaves an inheritance for your children's children. And I, pr I pray that God would speak through you into the lives of your sons and daughters. And I pray for the mothers who are in this room. Now I know that Mother's Day can be a difficult day. It's a, it's a day where we're super thankful. But it can also be different, uh, difficult. If your mother passed since last Mother's Day then this Mother's Day is going to hit different for you. And it, it could be painful. It could be a day where you celebrate, but a day where you commemorate as well. You'd be very sad because this is the first Mother's Day you've ever had where you can't actually hold your mother's hand or, or hug her or go to lunch or dinner with her, and maybe it's difficult for you. And then there are other people here who maybe you don't have a good relationship with your mother. And I pray for God. I pray for God to heal that broken relationship if you don't have a good relationship with your mother. And then there are other people in the room 
who you want to be a mother, but you're not a mother yet. And I know what that's like because my wife and I, there was a time where we wanted to have children and we hadn't had any yet. And we prayed in the space of nine years we prayed. One pastor that I worked for, he prayed for 20 years for he and his wife to conceive. My parents prayed for five years and, and doctors were involved and surgeries occurred just to, just to see if they could help the process at all. Obviously it worked and they were blessed with me, a genius, and good for them. <laughs> My parents prayed and they cried out to God. My wife and I cried out to God. Nine years we prayed. And about 50% of you have never heard this story. 50% of you obviously have. And I'm going to say this testimony for the rest of my life. My wife and I tried nine years to have kids. And we prayed and we prayed and we celebrated. We celebrated every time somebody else got pregnant. See, you're not spiritually mature and can, until you can start celebrating when other people get stuff you want. You know, about the time you can celebrate, somebody else gets the car in the color you wanted, you're just starting to grow up. About sometimes someone gets the house in the neighborhood you wanted, they got the curtains you wanted, come on, they got the wheels on the car you wanted, they got the job you wanted, you deserved it. You feel like you're smarter than them anyways, and they got it, and yet you rejoice for them, you're starting to grow up at that point. Come on, say amen to this. My wife and I, we had to grow up. We had to celebrate when my brother and my sister-in-law got pregnant. They already had one baby, and now they got another baby on the way, and we don't even have one baby on the way yet. But we celebrated. And we bought the gifts, and we went to the baby showers. And my cousin and her husband, they conceived. My little niece, Lauren, she'll, sometimes she'll come and sing here. And we celebrated whenever they conceived her. Whenever they can, my brother, brother and sister-in-law conceived my nephew, Justin, we celebrated. But deep down inside, there's this hurt and heartache because we're happy for them, but we're also well aware that we haven't yet received the desire of our heart. And we kept praying and we kept believing. And today, I just want to say, you better keep believing. You better keep pressing forward in your faith. Don't you dare quit. Don't you dare give up. We prayed nine years and... One man anointed us with oil and prayed for us. And he said, do you want a boy or a girl? I said, I don't care if it's a boy or a girl. I want a healthy baby. He said, I didn't ask you if you wanted a healthy baby. I want to know, do you want a boy or a girl? And I wouldn't relent. So I just said, well, we want a healthy little boy. He said, buy blue. And he prayed for us, anointed us with oil. My granddad said, honey, Get the crib ready. And he died, I think, like four months before my son was born. And I was sad because my grandfather never got to meet my son, but then the Holy Spirit reminded me he saw my son in the spirit before I saw my son in the flesh. My granddad called it out, and he said, get the crib ready. So you know what we did? We bought blue, and we bought a crib. And we went to the room we had a three-bedroom house, and we dedicated one of these rooms to our son, and we painted the walls blue. Come on, I'm talking about faith in this room. We painted the walls blue, and we bought little boys' clothes, and, and we hung them up on hangers like paintings in the room. Come on, you got to set the atmosphere to believe God for something. And we, we put the little boys' clothes his name is Silas Timothy Height, and we put his clothes up on the wall, and we got the crib ready. We set a crib up. No baby, but we got a crib. No baby, but we have clothes. No baby, but we got a, a little boy's room with little boy's toys all over the room. Because I, I believe that if the man of God said something under the unction of the Holy Spirit, I believe that, and come on, you can't receive until you believe for sure. We got the room ready and no child. And we prayed and prayed and prayed. And my wife and I were arguing. That's right. We were arguing like some of you argue. And we were arguing. Well, no, we didn't kill each other, but we just, we were arguing. And I said, you know what? I'm out. 
And I went to go play basketball. I got in my F-150 and just drove down the road. About 10 minutes after that, my wife calls me and says, you need to come home right now. I'm like, it's only been 10 minutes. She's like, no, come home right now. I think I'm pregnant. And I'm like, shut up. So I immediately come home. My mother beat me there. My mom skidded out in our whole front yard. There's like skid marks in our grass as she pulls up to the house. My mom was there before I was. And so help me God. And God did help us. And we conceived. And that was Mother's Day weekend that the Lord informed us that we had conceived Silas. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that. But I didn't just have faith on accident. Some of you are here today and you need to recognize that the faith you have, you have because, come on, you have this faith because of people who nurtured faith in God in your life. And I want to say to those maybe who are struggling to conceive, those couples that are praying about, and listen, I have people, I have people uh, who are in the room and I've had people who come to me, they're not even married and they're talking about we want to have a child. And so I want to say, let's find out every way that we can please God. And then that may include getting married, right? And then believing God that he'll give you as a married couple the desire of your heart. But there may be people in the room right now who you're trying to believe God. And I just want to say, this is not a regret in any way, shape, or form. I'm too blessed to have regrets. But I will tell you that in retrospect... If I could go back in time, I do think that maybe one thing I could have done, I could have done what one of my pastors did. Because at nine years of praying and believing, they adopted a child. And they adopted this little boy. And then another nine years later, they conceived their daughter. And sometimes it's a good idea to be somebody else's miracle on the way to your receiving a miracle. And there's a lot of orphans and there's a lot of foster kids. There's a lot of children who need you to step up in their lives. And it's not a lack of faith to adopt a child on the way to conceiving a child. I just want to make that as clear as possible. Timothy had faith because of his mother and his grandmother. And I want to say I thank God for Dorothy Hyde and Juanita Gant and Marianne Hyde. I thank God for these women of God, for Shirley Hyde, my mother. Would you just clap your hands for my mom who's here today? I thank God for my mom because so much of what I know today and so much of my theology and so much of what I believe is based on what my mother taught me. And anytime I talk about my mom, I'm talking about my dad. And anytime I talk about my dad, I'm talking about my mom because they are one. Say amen to that. And the scripture says that Paul is celebrating God's work, God's work in Timothy and pointing to his mother and to his grandmother as those who helped, Paul, who helped Timothy develop his faith. And what I want to talk to you just for a few seconds about is five lessons my mom taught me. Now, I don't have time to teach you all the lessons. I, I got time. You don't have time. I don't have time to teach you everything that she taught me. But I want to give you five lessons my mother, my mother taught us my two brothers and I. And the first thing comes out of Jude, Jude chapter, uh, Jude verse three and four. Read this with me on the screen or in your Bible. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you, contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. My mom Put all five points up so everybody can just start taking pictures of it. And uh, I want you to get this in your heart. My mom taught me to contend for the faith. My mother taught me to contend for the faith. This word contend, it really speaks of, it's like an athletic term in the original, in the original language. It's an athletic term, specifically that of wrestling. It's a little stronger version of the word agonize. In other words, faith is something you're going to painstakingly warfare over. You go to war over your faith. You don't have faith on accident. You have faith because you fight. 
You fight the enemy. You fight demon spirits and strongholds and powers and principalities and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. You have faith because you submit yourself, therefore, to God. You resist the devil and he flees from you. You have faith because you trust in Jesus. And you've got to fight for that faith. You have to contend for the faith. And I want to point something out. Contending for the faith is not merely what preachers do. Because Jude isn't talking to preachers. Jude is talking to the body. So everybody in this room, you need to know that you have never in your life seen a culture more, more intent on vilifying God and going against the God of the Bible and the culture God desires for this world. The culture of Eden or the culture of heaven and this is why we pray God your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is to in heaven we are to be the people who bring heaven to earth everywhere we go we should bring the governance of God the righteous reign of God we should bring the peace of God the love of God the mercy of God the grace of God when Christians show up people ought to be like man I'm glad they're here right now we needed them in this room we needed them in this office environment and this, this is contending for the faith, not just your words. You think that because you post a Christian meme on Facebook that you're contending for the faith? Come on, use your brain. You can fit ten for the faith when you live your faith out in front of broken people in the earth. And my mom, my mom contended for the faith. My mom wasn't confused about what a girl was or what a boy was. Oh, where are y'all at? My mom wasn't confused about what drunkenness was. My mom wasn't confused about how to raise us up and what to tell us to do and how to tell us to live and to exemplify that in front of us. And every Sunday, my mother would have on Charles Stanley or Jimmy Swaggart or Adrian Rogers, one of my personal favorites. And for th we went to church for three hours before we even went to church. I couldn't watch Voltron. I, I couldn't watch G-Force. I, I couldn't watch G.I. Joe or Transformers. I'd watch Adrian Rogers. And it was a blessing. My mom would contend for the faith every morning when she would wake us up on Sunday singing, everybody loves to go to Sunday school. And I'm like, everybody hates to go to Sunday school. Everybody does not love to go to Sunday school. And my mom contended for the faith, and she, she raised us up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. I know what it's like to see an open Bible on my mom's side dresser. I know what it's like to hear my mother pray. I know what it's like to hear my mother pray in the Holy Ghost. I know what it's like to hear my mother pray in the power of the Spirit and in the name of Jesus. And my mom contended for the faith, and she raised her sons to contend for the faith. And today, to the glory of God, and God gets all the glory, but today, both me and my brother Jason and my brother Chris, one in Orlando, one here in Melbourne, the favorite, and one in Daytona Beach, we're all going to contend for the faith and tell people that Jesus saves, heals, delivers, and sets free. We're going to fight over the gospel and we want to make it clear to people who are broken. Today I want you to know that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ will change everything in your life. What is the gospel? Jesus, born of a, he lived a perfect sinless. He died on the, for all of ours. He rose from the, and he's coming back. See, this is a church that is contending for this gospel. It's contending for this faith and fighting for this faith. And when I preach this to you, I preach it because my mom raised me to preach this message. I preach this to you. Don't ever underestimate the power of your prayers, mothers. Women, even if you're not a mother, you can be a spiritual mother. There are people in this room who need spiritual moms. I'm a spiritual dad. I have a biological son. I thank God for my son, Silas Timothy Height. But I have many spiritual sons in this room right now. I minister to him. I encourage him. I mentor him. But there's a whole host of sons in the Lord in this room that I minister to. And daughters that my wife ministers to. Are y'all still here? How does that happen? My mom taught me. My mom raised me up. My mom taught me how to pray, running around in the altar, shaking under the power of God, tearing the devil's head off. 
Let me tell you, you need somebody to pray with authority. You want my mom to pray. You want my mom. My mom don't play when she prays. I, I, I don't understand some people when they pray, oh, dear Lord Jesus. My mom's like, devil, you said what? You better step off right this second. I will rip your head off. My mom didn't play any games, and she taught us to contend for the faith, but not merely with our words, but with the lives that we live. And that is the single greatest struggle of my life. The third most difficult struggle in my ministry, some of you may know, is convincing the church that it's multicultural. That's the third greatest struggle of my ministry, is to teach people that heaven's not white or black or Hispanic, that heaven is multicultural. And when the church isn't multicultural, we miss an aspect of what heaven is. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to be surprised to heaven when they find out how many people don't look like them. Whoa, did I come to the right place? You ain't in hell. Thank God you made it to heaven. Come on, say amen. The second greatest struggle of my ministry has been convincing church people that lost people have to be the priority. Convincing church people that Jesus came to seek and save those whom were lost. And that church can't be just some buffet for spiritual people to come and get fat on. But literally we are to come here and learn how to love the hell out of this broken world that we're living in. And the single greatest struggle of my ministry has been living above reproach. That's the struggle of my life. And I thank God because I had a mother who taught me what was right. And let me tell you, if you're over 40 years old, quit blaming your parents for stuff. You're 40. I might could say if you're over 30 years old, you need to shut up. All right? After 30, you can't blame your mom and dad anymore. Listen, I've made many mistakes in my life, and all my mistakes are not 30 and 40 years ago. But my mom taught me to live right, and she contended for the faith in front of me, and she taught me how to fight for this faith in a very broken world. Not only did my mom teach me this, but she taught me to earnestly desire spiritual gifts. My mom is full of the Holy Ghost and fire. My mom, if you want somebody to pray and touch heaven, she's the one you want to pray for. I can guarantee you that. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and I want to read something to you. 1 Corinthians. See, I'm trying to be so spiritual up here and read out of my Bible. And it's on the screen right behind me. All right, here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and it says, what's the first two words? Pursue. And then it says what? Yet desire. How? Yet desire. There are people who are still arguing whether or not you can even have spiritual gifts. Well, I don't know if that's for today. Read your Bible. The scripture says to eagerly desire spiritual gifts. That's something that I saw my mom do. She eagerly desires spiritual gifts. My brothers and I were watching. There's a joke in my family that me and my brother Jason are kind of diet Pentecostal. And I just, I just believe that you can still use your brain and be filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what I believe. And I believe that, I believe that, that on Sunday morning, I'm not trying to scare people into heaven. I'm trying to inform people about who Jesus is. But we were watching some Pentecostals. That's how I grew up. I grew up Pentecostal, like hyper. I'm still detoxing on some of it. And, and we grew up Pentecostal. And so we're watching some Pentecostals on TV one week. And, I mean, they are getting it, y'all. And y'all, how many know what that looks like? And I mean, they're running and going. And me and my brothers were having fun. And my mom, who was in the kitchen, yells out, you boys better be careful making fun in there. Because she thought we might be making fun of the Holy Spirit. And we're like, Mom, we're not making fun, but we are having fun. And we were watching, and one of my idiot brothers said, Well, Mom, if you really like to worship that way, you ought to do that on Sunday morning at your church. I'm like, you better shut your face right now. I'm trying to win some lost people on Sunday morning. And so, anyways, my mom proceeds to say, Well, I would do that on Sunday, but I'm afraid my pastor might calm me down which I thought was hilarious. She's talking about me. So I guess I'm kind of like the Baptocostal in my family, right? But you know what? My mom taught me the importance of spiritual gifts. 
I've heard my mom pray with understanding, and I've heard my mom pray in the Holy Spirit. And here's what Paul says. He says, pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm prophesying to you. I'm speaking this word prophetically over your life. Prophecy is not just that which is predictory, but that which is adds value to your life in the spirit. And the scripture says, for one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks. Come on. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. You see, my mom taught me the importance of spiritual gifts, but she also taught me the importance of intelligence in their usage. So my mom says it's not enough to pray in the spirit. You also got to speak by the spirit. So my mom taught us to prophesy. And so today, today, me and my brother Jason and my brother Chris will be prophesying to congregations all over Central Florida. Every time I plant a campus, and we're going to have many campuses. Come on, Palm Bay people. Where are you at, Palm Bay people? Vieira people, where are you at? Titusville people, where are you at? Beachside people, where are you at? I drive by places on the beach and think, we could do this campus right here in this building. Every time we plant a campus and every time I give an altar call, every time we teach people to use spiritual gifts, to operate in the gifts, we do that because my mom showed me at some point in my life. And to all the women in the room, I want you to know your prayers are powerful. Your prayers are making a difference. And right now you may have a teenager who snuck out of the house and you heard on the police scanner in the middle of the night, abandoned Mazda B2000 truck, light blue in color, addressed to Kenneth Edward Height on 2510 Ranch Wooda Court. But you pray for that kid when he's out running around in the middle of the night, when he's not doing good in school, and when he gets, when he gets suspended in his senior year in the first semester, 10 days for being drunk at a football game. God's got a call on his life. Pray for your son. Pray for your daughter. Pray for your niece. Pray for your nephew. God's got a plan for them. And the devil's afraid of what your prayers are going to accomplish in their life. Come on, moms. Eagerly desire spiritual gifts. We contend for the faith. And that wayward teenager that you're praying for. That little nine-month-old that you're teaching to walk right now sometime in the future. They'll walk by the Spirit. And your prayers are availing even when you can't see it. Even when you don't see the work, when you don't see the change, God is working in ways you don't even realize. Not only did my mom teach us to contend for the faith, but my mom taught us to eagerly desire spiritual gifts. I want you this week in your prayer time to ask the Lord, God, show me what my gifts are. This week, one of my brothers sent me a video of Max Lucado. How many have ever read one of Max Lucado's books? Lift your hands. Well, did you know that Max Lucado spoke in tongues? Did you know that? This week I, I heard Max Lucado tell me himself. He said he was 64 years old. And most people wouldn't think of a Church of Christ pastor as being a guy who prayed in the Spirit this way. But he said when he was 64 years old, he was praying one day as he read this verse, pursue love. And by the way, there's a lot of people who have gifts but don't have love. And something's wrong with that. Come on, you got 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that tells you what the spiritual nine gifts of the Spirit are. And you got chapter 14 giving you some instruction on how to operate in those gifts. But chapter 13, which is in the middle of those chapters, is the love chapter. Love is kind. Love is patience. And you can speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but if you don't have love, you are nothing, the Bible says. This is why he says before you even have spiritual gifts, you need to have love for God and love for people. He says, pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts. And I thank God that I have a mother who taught me 
how to eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Contend for the faith, moms, but also pray in your personal prayer time. And Max Lucado said at 64 years old, when he read that verse, he said, God, is there something else that you have for me that I'm missing? Because if so, I want to get it. I don't want to miss whatever you have. And he said that the Lord moved over him in that moment and he, be, he began to pray in unknown tongues. And no, there was not an interpreter around because he was alone. Are you hearing what I'm saying? See, the scripture says to eagerly desire these things. And my mom taught us that. But not only did she teach us that, my mother taught me to stay curious and teachable. And one of my mom's favorite statements is this. I have more questions than answers. And, a world, and in a world where it seems like everybody knows everything. Everybody knows how to fix one another's life. They just can't fix their own life. Everybody knows how to counsel. They all do it on Facebook all the time. They can tell you how to vote. They can tell you how to talk. They can tell you how to speak, when to speak, how to do this and that. They just can't tell you how to get their act together. We need to stay curious. We need to stay teachable. You know, I'm in my 40s right now. And in my 40s, I've never, know, I've never known as much as I know today how important it is for me to be constantly curious about what God wants to do in my life in any given situation and circumstance. This is a time where I, I want to be more teachable than I've ever been. I just got back from two weeks of roundtables. Two weeks of roundtables where I literally immerse myself in a learning environment. And I go and I meet pastors who are ahead of me. And I meet pastors who are alongside of me. And I meet pastors who may just be a little behind where I'm at. And all of us together, I learn from all three groups. I learn from the pastors who are leading in front of me. I learn from the pastors who are leading around me. And I learn from the pastors who I might even be leading on some level. How does that happen? It happens because I'm still curious. It happens because I recognize I don't know it all and I want to be teachable. And Jesus, whenever he was born, the scripture says that the shepherds came to Mary and Joseph and they were speaking all the things that the angels told them. And this is uh, Luke chapter 2 verse 19 and also Luke chapter 2 verse 51. Two times in the same chapter. It's pretty important. Maybe we ought to take recognition of it. And the scripture says, after the shepherd spoke to her, the scripture said, but Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in their heart. All my life, I remember hearing my mom ponder the things of the Lord in her heart and sometimes she'd speak them out loud and sometimes she might just be thinking about stuff and I'd, I'd see her either thinking about something regarding church or regarding the spiritual walk uh, with the Lord but my mom pondered stuff and I watched her I watched her be teachable and learn which also means sometimes you got to admit that you haven't always gotten it right you can't learn anything unless you're also willing to unlearn some stuff that's not true my mom, like Mary, she would ponder stuff in her heart. Jesus, when Mary and Joseph left and they'd been traveling a couple days and they couldn't find Jesus. Well, Jesus was back at the temple. And he's asking questions and impressing all the people back there. And they were astonished with his wisdom and questions. And so when they finally find Jesus, Mary's like, Jesus, how are you going to do us like this? We've been looking at you. He's 12 years old. Come on. He said, did you not know that I would be in my father's house? Did you not know that I had to be about my father's business? And you know what Mary said? The scripture says that Jesus went with she and Joseph and came to Nazareth. And, and he continued in subjection. Hey, if Jesus could humble himself in subjection to his mother and father. Come on, we need to subject ourselves to God's authority in our lives. And the scripture says what she do. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And I just want to encourage mothers today, as you're praying for your kids, stay curious. I want to encourage mothers today, as you're praying for your teenager, stay curious. Stay teachable. It's possible that your teenager may have some things to share with you that the Lord has placed in their heart. And now I have a mother who every time she goes to church, she has to listen to her son. Can you imagine 
changing my diapers, come on, wiping my snotty nose, come on, come on, taking me to school, picking me up when I lied and said I was sick, I had sickiitis, and then I got healed every time that I came home. I was like, let's go to McDonald's. She's like, I thought you were sick. I feel better, Mom. You've been praying. <laughs> and she has to listen to me preach? Y'all better pray for my mom. My mom knows where all the bodies are buried. My mom knows me, y'all. And yet she comes in week after week and hears me preach or my brothers preach, Jason or Chris. And you know, it's funny because she can't even hardly get into church without having one of her family preach at her. She grew up, she's a pastor's kid. So her dad was her pastor, and she thought she escaped being in a pastor's family, and now her sons preach at her every Sunday. You know what? You know what you got to do? You got to stay curious, family. You got to stay teachable. That's what it is. We just got to be curious and teachable. We got to be asking, Holy Spirit, what is it that you want to say to me? So not only did my mom teach me to contend for the faith, and not only did my mom teach me to eagerly desire spiritual gifts, not only did my mom teach me to stay curious and teachable, my mom taught me about going after lost people. And earlier in this message, I told you guys that my mother... My mother, well, earlier I mentioned Luke 19.10. This says the son of man, the son of, the son of man has come to seek and save those which were lost. And one of the greatest struggles of my life has been one of the greatest, the second greatest, was teaching church people that God has called us to reach lost people. So look, once you get saved, it's not about you anymore. Once you become a believer in Jesus... It's no longer about you. You deny yourself, take up your cross, and you follow Jesus. And in following Jesus, that means that you got to love the people God places in your life even when you don't want to. You have to grow up. And you can't grow up if you make everything about you. And that's what so many church people do. That's what so many churches do. It's what so many movements in the body of Christ do. They make it all about them. When God says, I didn't send Jesus for a bunch of church people, I sent Jesus for dead people, for lost people, for people who were dead in their trespasses and sins. And that's who, that's who we were. Look around you. Look down the row. Look down the row. That's a bunch of sinners Jesus saved. Come on. Look down the row. Look down the row. Pull your phone out. Look like you're taking a selfie. Everybody, right now, open up your camera and turn it around where you can view yourself. Come on. Look, that's a sinner you're looking at. Come on, let's take a sinner picture. Y'all ready? Here we go. Let's take a one, two. Look here. Y'all see that guy? I know he's brilliant and handsome. That guy right there. That guy needed Jesus. And guess what? I still need Jesus. I still need Jesus every day of my life. But there was a time in my life where I was separate from God, where I didn't know God, and I was stuck in my sins, where I was dead in my sins, and Jesus raised me to life. My mother, my mother and my father, when I was a young child in the late 60s and 70s, they drove on church buses to go out into the community and pick children up and bring them to church and teach them about Jesus. My mom and dad taught Sunday school. My mom, they contended for the faith, and they went after lost people. My mom, when I was a youth pastor in 1998 and 99, my mother was driving a church van every Wednesday night. She'd work just like everybody. We're all week long. She's working long days, and then she'd be at the church an hour or an hour and a half early on Wednesday night in order to get in a stinky van that smelled like sweaty teenagers and she got in that van that didn't even have the best ac hadn't been vacuumed lately come on and she would go out and she would go to neighborhoods sometimes all kinds of different neighborhoods sometimes she'd go to a neighborhood where there'd be more white people sometimes she'd go to neighborhoods where there'd be more black people sometimes she'd go to neighborhoods where there'd be hispanic people but she didn't let any of that stop her from going to the neighborhood she needed to to get somebody to the church to hear about who jesus was my mother taught me how to go after lost people she taught me how to not make it all about us and to make it about the goal that God had in mind when he sent Jesus. 
And then I want to say this. I decided to end this, this because usually, you know, you have your points and then you have a conclusion. But this is my conclusion. The fifth thing that I want to share with you that my mom taught me, and this is the last thing I'll share. My mom taught, put them up for everybody. My mom taught me to, to pray in the name of Jesus. My mom taught me to pray in the name of Jesus. And I just want to say that when you pray in the name of Jesus, you're not just praying in the name of someone. You're praying in the nature and authority of someone. So when I pray in the name of Jesus, see the name of Jesus is precious. It's why you contend for this faith. You fight for this faith because this was a precious faith. You know, you could have, we have guards at this school full time. The guards are here all, all the time. Parkhurst Academy, we've got guards out here. You know why? Because the people who are in the school are precious to us. We've got guards here, armed guards who are prepared to protect the students who are here, here in this school. we got armed guards here today while we're in church. Why? Because you're precious people and we want to protect you and we're thankful for you. You go into, you go into an art gallery and there's an armed guard there. Why? Because there's something pre precious there that they want to protect. We fight for this because the name of Jesus is precious and sweet and powerful. And in, in John chapter 14, this is the chapter where Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. And it's that part where he's telling them who he is, where he's going. And later on, he says this to him. I love this. He says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe what? Believe because of the works themselves. In other words, Jesus was healing the sick, raising the dead, prophesying about the future. And here's what Jesus says. Truly, truly, I say to you, read this out loud. He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Come on. And and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. And I just want to say about this briefly. I often say it when I reference this scripture. Everybody in the church seems to want to focus on greater works than Jesus. But maybe we need to go back a little bit in the verse that says, the works that I do, Jesus said, will you do? I mean, before you do greater works than Jesus, why don't you just conquer raising the dead and healing the sick? Let, let's start with that first and then maybe talk about greater works. He says, whatever. Everybody say, whatever. whatever. Read this verse, 3, 2, 1. Whatever you ask, that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I, come on, I will. What are you going to do with that? You can't sleep on that verse. you got to stand on that verse. Having done all, you've got to stand, putting on the full armor of God. You've got to trust God and believe that God's word is true even when it doesn't make sense in your life. When you pray and you don't get what you want, you keep praying. You don't stop praying. You push. You pray until something happens. If you pray one day and you don't get what you want, you pray another day. If you pray that day and you don't get what you know God has ordered into your life, then you pray a third day. And you may pray a year but then you pray another year and if you haven't gotten what you want after two years then you pray three years and if you don't get what you know God has promised from the word after three years then you pray four years and if it takes five years and my parents prayed five years and got me and then I prayed six years and seven years and eight years and nine years and I got a promise right over here a 20 year old who loves Jesus and loves serving Jesus my, one of the pastors who I work for prayed for nine years a adopted a child but kept believing God and after 18 years of marriage conceived and I'm just telling you we serve a supernatural God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think according to the power of God that is at work within your life don't you dare stop praying in the name of Jesus and here's what it sounds like when your kid's sneaking out of windows father I pray in the name of Jesus get him home tonight and God, I pray in the name of Jesus that I don't kill him when I get to him, God. God, I pray in the name of Jesus for my spouse. My spouse is demon-possessed, God. I pray for him in the name of Jesus. God, 
I pray for my singleness. I'm lonely. Any singles in the house? Make some noise, single people. Listen, you can... <laughs> you didn't sound very happy. And I, I can't leave that alone. I always have to, I always have to deal with this. I, I say, where are all the single people? And they're like, Woo, like this. And you're all like, you think getting married is going to make you happy. And I ask, where are all the married people? And they're like, mm. <laughs> you better learn to be happy when you're single or you'll never be happy when you get married. The, hey, hold on. Stop clapping. Stop, 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 stop. The dumbest thing you can do is marry a miserable person who fooled you. Man, what you think? They show you the highlight reel when you're out on a date. They're giving you the best first impression, y'all. You better hang out longer than 30 days. My mom taught me to pray in the name of Jesus. A lady came up to me about, and when she prayed for me, she was praying in the name of Jesus. This week, I want you to pray in the name of Jesus. Moms, pray in the name of Jesus. Everything you ask, Jesus said, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you can ask what you will and it shall be done. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. God wants you to bear fruit. God wants you to, God wants you to have your prayer requests answered. He wants to do this in your life. So you keep praying and you pray in the authority of the name of Jesus. God, I pray this prayer in accordance with your word. It's a promise in your word. I pray this in the name of Jesus. I'm not talking about foolishness either. I'm not talking about, God, I pray to win the lottery in the name of Jesus. You see, my mom was spirit-filled, but she didn't do goofy stuff like sprinkle salt around the house. My mom was full of the Holy Ghost. She didn't have to go to psychic mediums. She wanted a word from God. She didn't need a horoscope. She read the Bible. My mom didn't do weird stuff like bury chicken bones in the yard and consult crystals. My mom prayed in the name of Jesus. And I want to encourage people to put your crystals down. Put, put your incense away. And, and, and put, put away your horoscope and start praying in the name of Jesus. How are you going to defeat the enemy working with the enemy? You need to pray to your Savior who's already defeated the enemy, and then you'll overcome. You'll walk in victory. God's already afforded you. My mom taught us to pray in the name of Jesus. I had a lady right here, Pam Mills. Pam Mills is right back here, a friend of my family, really family, church family for years. And Pam Mills, I'm not going to cry when I tell this story. I did in the first experience. <clears throat> Pam comes up to me and says, how old are you? And I told her I was 48, and she said, I've loved you for 50 years. I'm like, what? How did you love me for 50 years? I'm still in my 40s. You can't love me for 50 years if, I've been, if I'm in my 40s. And she said, no, you don't understand. Pam said, I was in the altar week after week after week 50 years ago when your mom went to the altar Sunday after Sunday after Sunday crying out to God for a miracle. She said, I didn't know you, but I loved the child God was going to give your mom. And I remember when your mom would be praying in the altar, crying out to God. And I'm so thankful for a spirit-filled, Bible-believing, gospel-preaching, devil-stomping-on woman of God for a mother. And I just, I just believe, I just believe in this room, there's some women of God in this room who are going to be praying in the name of Jesus this week. And you're going to quit cowering down to the enemy. And you're not going to let him push you around like a little doll. But you're going to stand up and pray in the authority of the name of Jesus. And the devil's going to pay this week for all the hell that he's brought in your life. You're not going to play any more games with him. But you're going to pray with power and authority. My mom prayed for five years and was blessed. And I mean blessed. With me. Now, she has three sons. But she prayed the most for me. My, my younger brother, Jason, he's an afterthought at this point. And my youngest brother, he's a happy accident. But she prayed for me, y'all. She believed God for me. 
She was anointed in the altar for me. My mom prayed in the spirit for me. Chris was like, what? <laughs> My brother's conceived and she's like, how'd this happen? Well, let me just say, these are lessons that my mom taught me, and I got many more that I could share, but this is my time for today. So maybe, maybe I'll preach this some more this year, or next year I'll preach some more lessons my mom taught me, or maybe my mom can teach next Mother's Day. That would be cool too. So, hey, you want to come up and say anything? You got the microphone. I'll hand it to you right now. Come on. You want to say something? Come on up. Glory to God. I thank God for my mom. Come on. Thank you, Pastor Austin. All right, y'all are in big trouble now. The only thing I thought that I wanted to say when he was talking about fighting, or what was your first point, Ken? Ten contend for the faith and he talked about fighting the bible says fight the good fight of faith it is a good fight that you're fighting fighting and another thought that i i did this several months ago i no longer call the enemy by his name you know when somebody remembers your name it kind of makes you feel good you know and you're embarrassed sometimes to admit that you don't remember somebody's name. I know my enemy's name, but I refuse to say it unless sometimes I just slip. He is only known as my enemy. But when you contend for the faith, you're fighting a good fight. And you have the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Listen, I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I believe in all nine of them. I don't always operate in all nine of them. But I believe they're for us today. And God has, I, I actually lost my thought on that, Ken. I am almost 72, so, you know, I could actually do or say anything at any time and get away with it. But this, I know what I was going to say. People want a word. One, one Sunday, I got to hurry because I know one Sunday I went out and there was a lady that walked in the um, foyer and Cher said she wants us to pray with her well she was from another church and she just happened to come in and she was said I was hoping that someone would have a word for me and I'll be honest that didn't sit too well for me because I thought God has a whole book full of words for you and sometimes we're wanting other people to give us a word when we're really just too lazy to pick up the word and see what he has to say God wants to talk to you he wants to give you a word you make time for him we have to make time for him and I was convicted in something Ken said because my yard it's it's beautiful to me it's not beautiful to everybody else and I make time for it and I was really convicted when Pastor Ken said about making time for Christ in our lives and I thought I can do better you want a word from the Lord pick it up and read it God has a word for you love you very much thank God Thank you, Jesus. When I, was, uh, when I was born, I was a little needy. I know that may surprise y'all. And uh, my mom worked at, 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 my mom worked at uh, AT&T as an operator. Y'all don't know nothing about pay phones and operators. You don't know nothing about dial zero. <laughs> so, so my mom... She dropped me off at the daycare. My grandmother ran the daycare. And I would cry, and uh, I'd cry and run down the street. And my mom couldn't stand to see me cry and run down the street. And so she stopped working at AT&T to go home and raise, raise my needy self. So <laughs> anyways, I'm thankful. I'm thankful. You, mothers. Mothers, listen. You're building a legacy right now. Your kids are going to tell your legend to your grandkids. 
And dads, I know it's not Father's Day, but you're building your legend now too. So build it strong and build it on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, help us today. Help us, Almighty God, to seek your face, to seek your kingdom above everything else. God, we need you to guide us, but God, we need you to rule in our lives. So God, have your way in us. All over this room, God, move supernaturally in families. I know, God, it's not prophetic, it's just statistical that in the room right now, there's a lot of hurt in this room. Heal it in the name of Jesus. God, where deliverance is necessary, God, deliver people in the name of Jesus. God, where healing is necessary, heal marriages, heal relationships, and heal sick bodies. We rebuke disease in the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. And God, we rebuke bitterness and resentment and offense and unforgiveness. God, anger and rage in the name and authority of Jesus Christ. We pray for healing in this room. Sweep into this room, God, and move supernaturally. God, let us be able to say on Monday, let us be able to say on Monday, let us be able to say on Tuesday and Wednesday, God moved in my life. God, give us a testimony. Give us a testimony. Give us a testimony of the saving grace of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm looking at a room with people who have a spiritual legacy. I'm looking at a room with people, I, I know you, I know you, Pam Mills, Lois Maddox. Need I say more? Your mom was a fiery, powerful woman of God. Well, guess what? Who she is is who you are. You have the anointing of God, the same anointing that your mother had, you have. The anointing of God on you, it's going gonna, it's gonna to flow down into your children's lives and into your grandchildren's lives. All over the room, I wish you'd pray for supernatural breakthroughs right now for all of your children and grandchildren right now. Your nieces and nephews or spiritual sons and daughters or people that you're called to nurture and encourage their faith, pray for them right now. Father, use us all over this room. God, use us as, as instruments, God, in your hand, as weapons in your hand. Use us, God, to defeat the enemy and to declare the greatness of the name of Jesus in this broken world. God, build legacies all over the room and we'll give you the glory and the praise for it, God, in Jesus' name.